Hello and uh, welcome to this computational creativity session here at the AI and Gaming Research Summit. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of speakers set up for you. We have Anastasia Opera from Embark Studios, Christoph Zager from University of Hertfordshire, and York Neumann from the Microsoft Flight Simulator team. And uh, the way this will work is that everyone will have some time to do their individual presentations and then uh, we'll switch up to do a Q&A for everyone. So please, while everyone, uh, while the speakers are giving their talks, uh, write your questions in the Q&A tab and then also vote for ones that you're very interested in and then I'll be able to pick some uh, for the Q&A session. I am Vanessa Foltz and I will be chairing you in this session. I am an AI researcher at Model AI, which is a startup company that brings AI research to the games industry. And I'm also an honorary lecturer at Queen Mary University in London. And with this, it seems like the time is to go. And um, here are some hashtags in case you want to follow uh, on Twitter as well. Uh, but without much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Anastasia Opera. Um, she is an artist, as I said, working at Embark Studios in Stockholm. Um, the cool thing is that she mostly uses algorithms as her paintbrushes and what, uh, she's going to talk to us uh, about her experimental product where she uses example-based procedural placement to help her in her art. So Anastasia, take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Vanessa. So yeah, um, I'm a procedural artist at Ambar Studios and um, kind of a quick disclaimer before we start. Uh, the audience of the original version of this presentation was a wider game development community. So I apologize if some stuff, especially in the beginning, might seem quite basic to you. And I'm also going to try to maintain quite fast pace to not go over time. So if you have to blink, do it now. Um, so you might be wondering, what is example-based procedural placement? When we create a digital scene, probably the most common way of doing it would be placing each asset by hand. However, that can quickly become tedious and any future modification would have to be carried out by hand too. Thus, the creative iteration loop of how fast we can explore new ideas and iterate on existing ones becomes stifled by execution time it takes for each iteration. Another way would be to write a small procedural algorithm to have the computer do the tedious work for us. However, writing an algorithm requires translating creative intent into a logic-based code, which is time-consuming and poses a knowledge barrier for many. And it also forces us to interrupt our creative loop to solve the idea to code translation problem. With example based placement, we would like to automate this process, thus reinforcing our creative loop without interrupting it. And we do so by asking the user to provide an example of what they want, which we automatically analyze and break down into rules. And with these rules, we can synthesize new, similar looking content. There are many ways how one can design a user interaction with an example based placement algorithm. In our experiment, we embodied the algorithm into this little creature, whom we named Kittos. Kittos tries to assist you by mimicking your placements. It analyzes the neighborhoods of objects you place and finds similar looking locations in the level in real time. So if you place the grass near a tree and a rock, Kittos will place a new grass near another tree and a rock, using your previous placement as an example. And this I place, you place interaction was part of a slightly bigger experience, a project called Kitty Wake, where you are on a small planet and together with multiple Kitai, you populate it with assets and give it a bit of life. So this is how Kitty Wake looks like. This is a recording of me playing a session. Overall, this project was a very educational experience for us. We released it internally at Embark on our own tech stack written in Rust. We got a bunch of interesting user feedback. For example, it surfaced such questions as what is the ideal relationship with Kittos? Are they just like your tools, like your slaves obeying blindly? Or are they more like pets that are allowed to have a mischievous mind of their own? And how much of the error or misunderstanding of the algorithm would the user attribute to that kind of personification? At the same time, Kitty Wake evoked a more micromanagemental mood than we intended due to Kitty and users sharing the same action space of direct placements, resulting in bidirectional ambiguity of intent. And one can probably do a separate purely UX dedicated talk about Kitty Wake, but this presentation is more about how Kitty work on the inside. 
We're going to talk about a lot of fairly technical things that comprise a kitty brain, such as possibility spaces, sampling the space with Markov chain Monte Carlo, defining similarity match with placements, and also have a brief introduction to optimal transport and Wasserstein distance. My main goal is to give you an intuition about these pieces and hopefully inspire you to use some of them in your own work. So let's start, uh, let's start our deep dive by introducing you to Kitas Bob and Kitas Mary, and we will use their placements as an example. So Bob and Mary like being close to each other, but not too close. They do like their personal space. And being too far apart is also not great and makes them sad. One can say they have a very functional relationship, meaning we can express Mary's and Bob's happiness as a function of their proximity to one another, which can be illustrated with a graph like this one. Now suppose Bob and Mary are moving into a new town, which is a lovely one-dimensional street, and we are faced with the task of finding a new home that would make them happy, according to their happiness function, which says that they are most happy when they're about one meter apart. But instead of reasoning about Bob and Mary in world space, let's separate Mary's and Bob's locations into their own axes. Thus, any configuration of Bob and Mary can now be expressed as a point in this new two-dimensional space. For example, this point with the coordinates 4 and 6 would simply represent that Mary is on coordinate 4 and Bob is on coordinate 6. And now we can easily explore all possible Bob-Mary placements just by moving around in this new two-dimensional space, which we will call possibility space, since it describes all possible Bob-Mary configurations. Note how every configuration corresponds to a certain value in the score function, indicated by the moving yellow dot on the right. We can evaluate the score for every point in the possibility space and visually see where good Bob Mary configurations tend to form. In general, we are interested in the regions of high scores indicated by yellow dots in the possibility space. We can change the initial score function and see how regions of good solutions would change as well. For example, if we introduce bimodality to our score function that is reflected in our possibility space as well as in the final solutions we would present in the world. One can say that the regions of good solutions are shaped by Mary's and Bob's score function, meaning that the placement rules are not defined explicitly in code, but are the parameters of our algorithm. In turn, that means that within the same framework, we can generate different Bob-Mary placement configurations just by changing the score function. Okay, but so far we've only talked about uh, two kitai, meaning our possibility space was defined by only two parameters, making it two-dimensional and easy to visualize and talk about. Now suppose Mary's distant cousin decides to move in. Well, now when reasoning about good solutions, we need to take his position into account too, making our possibility space three-dimensional. Now imagine the whole family decides to move in and they all have their own preferences for placements. Well, visualizing that becomes tricky and it's not just a problem of visualization. Our possibility space grows exponentially as we add more dimensions, but the regions of good solutions shrink as we add more constraints. Intuitively speaking, it's much easier to make two key to happy than 60. In numerical analysis and machine learning, this problem is called the curse of dimensionality. As our problem space becomes sparse, meaning it's big and filled with mostly bad solutions, finding good ones becomes non-trivial, especially if we'd like to do that in interactive times. And the more dimensions we have, the more dark and full of terrors our search space is. So what can we do? Let's consider an imaginary, many-dimensional possibility space. For the purpose of an example, I'm going to portray it in 2D, but you can imagine that moving from one point of the space to another involves tweaking dozens of parameters. And just as before, every point is associated with some kind of score. And sure, right now we can see where good scores are, but suppose that the space is just so big that we physically cannot visit every single point. We need to deploy some kind of search strategy. And one way of doing it would be searching at random. We just traverse the space by randomly choosing direction every single step. We can be lucky and stumble upon something great, but chances of that consist happening consistently are very small. So we can perhaps guide this randomness by asking it to only accept a step in a new direction if the score would become better. This search strategy is called greedy, and it sounds good on paper, however, it tends to get stuck in local maxima, meaning it would find an okay solution that will be surrounded by bad solutions. So no matter what new direction it will try, all of them will be worse. And then we have Markov chain Monte Carlo, short MCMC. In particular, we are using Metropolis Hastings. I like to think about it something in between greedy and random, since MCMC, just like greedy, would accept a new step if it's better. However, if the step is worse, unlike Greedy, which would just discard it, MCMC has a chance of accepting it, a chance inversely proportional to how much worse this new score is. Thus, MCMC will gravitate towards good scores, but not get stuck in local maximum. And with enough number of steps, we can be sure it will find a good solution. But doesn't it all sound like a lot of work? Wouldn't it like take forever to find the best solution in real scenario? Well, the reality is that we are not interested in the best solution. We are interested in a good enough solution that we can find in reasonable time. And when this time becomes real time, that's when it starts feeling magical. 
So we know we're going to be comparing a lot of different placement configurations with one another. You can say one of the core questions of our search strategy is which one is better and by how much? Because if it's better, we accept it. And if it's worse, we need to know by how much. So we can use that ratio as a probability of accepting or rejecting it. And with Kitai, comparing one Kitai placement to another was pretty simple because a score was defined by a function that was given to us. All we had to do is plug in the distance between Bob and Mary and see what values our function spits out and then use it for comparisons. But what do we do if we're not given a score function, but just an example of how we want our placement to look like? Suddenly the question which one is better, A or B in this case, becomes rather ambiguous. We can probably pick one which is better based on some kind of internal judgment, but how do we quantify by how much it's better? We need a numerical way of expressing how similar one spatial object arrangement is to another. So it has to be some kind of function that takes our example and compares it to another object arrangement. For example, we can notice that A is practically the same as our example, except for the rock and the tree being swapped places. We can move parts of B2 and notice that with just a few more steps, we can make B identical to the example as well. If we count how many steps we performed, we can see that A took us fewer steps than B. So we are starting to get a procedure that sort of reflects our intuition about similarity. And now we can invert these numbers and use them to compute that arrangement A is twice as good as arrangement B. And this was one of our key observations when working on example-based placement. The similarity, similarity of two arrangements, X and Y, can be expressed in terms of minimum number of steps it takes to morph X into Y. So we are like literally asking how much work does it take to fix X to look like Y. And so happens that we are in a great luck because this formulation sounds a lot like mathematical field called optimal transport. In case you've never heard of optimal transport, here's a small sketch to introduce you to what it is about. So imagine two mathematicians lying on a beach. It's lovely sunset, smooth silky sand. And then one of them says, why don't we build a sand castle from the sand on this beach? And of course, being a practical mathematician, the other one is, they ask, but how much work would it take to move the sand from its original shape into the shape of a castle? And the other mathematician would reply, trivial, my friend, the work we would need to do is proportional to the total distance traveled by each grain of sand we move. We can minimize this work with this transport plan. And the transport plan just tells us how much stuff we need to move from one location to another, how much sand we need to move from the left part of the beach to make the castle tower. And usually we are interested in finding the optimal plan that would minimize the work one would need to do. So the other mathematician would exclaim, the Wasserstein distance between this beach and a sand castle is not as big as I thought. Translated to human English, that would mean it's not as much work as I thought it would be. Wasserstein distance, even though it sounds quite fancy, is just the minimum amount of work one would need to, in our case, move the sand into a shape of a castle. And the exciting part is that we do not need to find the optimal transfer plan to calculate Wasserstein distance if we are in one dimension, since 1D Wasserstein has a very neat closed form solution, which is very fast and easy to calculate. All we need to do is take cumulative distribution functions of the castle and the beach and simply find an area between them, which is in discrete case, such as a histogram, becomes simply a binwise absolute difference. Unfortunately, this trick doesn't work for more dimensions, but soon you will see just how much we can do with that single dimension. So returning to the original question we had of which object arrangement is better and by how much, we can now use our new similarity metric that is defined in terms of Wasserstein distance. So the bigger the distance is, meaning it takes more work for us to morph something to look like an example, the lower our similarity and score are. That allows us to numerically compare different object arrangements based on the user's example. We have been comparing the whole example arrangement. Unfortunately, with such a formulation, we would only have a good score if we make a perfect coffee. If we just deviate a little from the example, our similarity would instantly lower. This highlights a fundamental issue. We don't want to generate something that is exactly like the example. Instead, we would like to infer the rules of the example placements. To do so, just like in many of the prior work, we assume that the final result is a product of neighborhood rules interacting with each other. And that interaction is the core that makes one's example look like itself. And if we capture those, we can synthesize different but similar looking arrangements. And we do it by asking each synthesized object, what is your neighborhood? Then we search for the most similar neighborhood that exists in the example 
And it might so happen that there is no perfect match, but that would not be a problem because we will just use the same Wasserstein based similarity metric, which would return us a score describing how similar the synthesized object's neighborhood is to a neighborhood from the example. We can repeat this process for every object and then take a product of all individual object scores to calculate the final score for this whole synthesized arrangement. The way I like to think of it is if every object has a preference, like the house wants to be close to grass and far away from tree, but the grass wants to be close to the tree and so on. And then the final score represents how happy each object or all the objects are together with this particular arrangement. So by moving the objects around, we change how happy they are and, uh, and their affected neighbors with their new neighborhoods. And we use Metropolis Hastings to guide this iterative process and find such a configuration of placements that would satisfy everyone. For example, here the example is to have a rock and a tree close together and grass scattered around. And of course, if we change the example, our solutions change as well, and we can restart the possibility space search to find novel solutions. Thus, we can generate a whole variety of placements that would satisfy the example. There is, however, a catch. All of our neighborhoods are 2D, but remember our sketch about Wasserstein distance? Only one D Wasserstein has a nice closed form solution. The trick we use for calculating it just wouldn't work for 2D. So what do we do? We started with an approach used in prior work, compress our 2D neighborhood into a 1D representation by considering only the distances to neighborhood centers instead of relative 2D positions. And often the distance information is enough to represent the example. However, in some cases it was still problematic. Like in this example where we want to build a road mosquitoes. And it was just completely failed to continue our example, and we do something that just doesn't align with our own intuition of where next placement should occur. So yeah, so why is this happening? When we compress our neighborhood into pure distances, we lose angular information. Kitos can no longer see the difference between a rock on the left versus a rock on the right. Often two very different neighborhoods would look exactly the same in Kitos' eyes. And the question of how to combat this stumbled me during our first prototypes until smart people on Twitter and my colleague Tomasz Stachowiak suggested sliced Wasserstein. So what is sliced Wasserstein? Imagine that this is a neighborhood we are trying to compare to some other neighborhood. We literally slice through it with, in this case, three lines, S1, S2, and S3. We project the whole neighborhood onto each of those slices, thus approximating the 2D positions of our neighborhood with multiple 1D projections. And to compare with another neighborhood, we compare each slice with a corresponding slice from another neighborhood. And then we can calculate the nice and easy 1D Wasserstein for each of those pair of slices. And by summing these Wasserstein's together, we have computed sliced Wasserstein, which is approximately proportional to the true Wasserstein. And that kind of approximation is completely okay for us because we are only interested in relative comparisons anyway, not the true values. And probably the best part about sliced Wasserstein is that it's very fast to compute. In fact, we can control exactly the speed by changing the number of slices, thus trading off approximation accuracy. And now Kitos can build rows with us. And notice how by placing the rock um, to kind of to the right, that sort of creating direction altitude to the road, Kitos continues the curvature. And if I place grass on the right, it does so as well. And so it will also do that with trees. So yeah, good kiddos. To summarize, we've talked about our experimental project Kitty Wake, where we set out to explore a feeling of co-creation with an example-based placement algorithm. Then we dived into possibility space, which represents all possible outputs of our algorithm. And when the space becomes too big, we need to deploy search strategy, such as Markov chain Monte Carlo. However, for the search to work, we need a way to score every new proposed arrangement. Thus, we covered a way to numerically express similarity between two spatial arrangements of objects. It's important to know that this metric is not equivalent to how humans perceive patterns, but it is a convenient assumption. Next, we talked about how optimal transport can help us to formulate our similarity metric and quickly compute it in 1D. Then we talked about breaking down the example into neighborhood interactions to synthesize similar looking arrangements that are not a copy of the example. Then we showed how to compare 2D neighborhoods when you only have 1D Wasserstein, either by only considering distances to neighborhood centers or using sliced Wasserstein. And finally, we've shown how it all comes together into Kitty assisting you with placements and co-creating a small scene together. And before we wrap up, 
I'd like to take a moment to admire the network of interconnected research and ideas that allowed us to build the example-based placement algorithm. And was, I would also like to give a shout out to Tomasz Sachowiec, who was a huge contributor to the algorithm, as well as thank all the people who helped to bring Kitty Way to life, as well as embark for its amazing brew of so many talented people and super passionate culture. Yeah, and one last thing. Uh, we were asked to include what we think the biggest opportunity and challenge are at the intersection of AI and gaming research. So um, we at Embark have been having a recurring discussion motivated partially by our experiments, such as Kitty Wake. So on one side, we have traditional software that assumes you know exactly what you want, like Photoshop or Unity. It assumes that you have full knowledge of the domain principles, such as composition and art, or what makes character movement fun in a game. And it gives you this Swiss army knife of options on how to achieve that as fast as possible. On the other spectrum, when embedding domain knowledge into our tools, so it can compose any genre of music, it knows everything about professional photography. I feel it's easy to fall into a trap of a magical press a button and we do everything for you tool, which marginalizes user agency in favor of opinions or statistical evidence of what's good. And from the user perspective, it is like an antithesis of a creative iteration loop. So I believe finding that sweet spot for user agency, especially for a non-professional user, that's the biggest challenge. And it is at the intersection of UX and technology. But I'm gonna be cheeky and also say that that's where the biggest opportunity is. Uh, if we can derive an approachable set of meaningful controls and a tuned rhythm of creation in our assistant tools, I believe we can tap into enabling casual creativity in such a principles heavy domain as games and empower individuals and hobbyist communities to self-express through game making and share that expression with others. And that will be it. Thank you very much for listening and I'll be handing it back to Vanessa. Thank you so much, Anastasia. That was very interesting. And, and there were cats, so that's always good. And I'm sure there will all uh, be a lot of questions. So uh, we'll have to do uh, handle those in the QA session afterwards. So remember to put them in the moderated Q&A and upvote others questions. Um, since now we're going to go straight over to our next speaker, Christoph Sager. Um, Christoph Zeiger uh, is a tenured research fellow at the University of Hertfordshire, just north of London in the UK. And uh, he's been doing various um, types of AI and games research, uh, specifically also related to intrinsic motivation. And one of um, his more recent interests is the Minecraft Settlement Generation Challenge which he will uh, started in 2018 and is going to talk about today. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, and hello, everyone. So uh, glad to be here, and I have to say I'm unironically a big fan of the uh, Microsoft PowerPoint Slide AI. So this was a good excuse to actually like use it. So. Um, before I get into the talk, and in case we get disconnected here, basically the two takeaway messages I want you to have. If you like what you're seeing today about the competition, we literally just started our fourth yearly round this week, so you can participate. If you like that, uh, check us out later online and uh, join the competition. The more scientific topic I try to convince you of is that uh, creativity and co-creativity are part of intelligence and even young people on Minecraft can do them. So we should figure out how an AI can do them too. So what have we done to get there? Well, uh, we've organized the AI settlement uh, generation competition. And uh, the idea here is uh, that our participants write code that makes interesting Minecraft settlements, and they then send that code to us. We, there are different frameworks in which they can write the code in. We then apply it to secret Minecraft maps that they don't know beforehand. And then we take those maps and we send them out to judges, uh, human judges, who basically score them on a variety of criteria that I'm going to talk to a little bit later. And then we basically have uh, a good time, look at a lot of Minecraft settlements and um, enjoy. Um, you probably want to see how that actually looks. So I brought you a video. Um, that I cut together of several of these um, cool settlements. And I really try to capture that amazing feeling of kind of coming home to a civilization after going through like a dark and uh, kind of dangerous Minecraft world. And this is from last year. So uh, this was actually a really big new feature. People have put down massive set pieces, uh, such as a massive quarry, or we have a roller coaster slash monorail that's 
procedurally generated. So keep in mind all the stuff you're seeing here are made by algorithms that don't actually know the map beforehand. So they have to go in, analyze what kind of blocks there are, what kind of terrain there is, and then um, basically uh, try to figure out uh, things based on this. We also have actually nowadays a so-called chronicle generation where we encourage people to also make books that are about the stuff they are generating. So this one generator actually creates um, uh, a lot of interesting uh, diaries of people and they get buried with them. So you have to dig up their graves. Uh, here's me just uh, driving on the roller coaster uh, through this like, uh, you know, uh, more modernist uh, Minecraft settlement. And it has a really, really bleak feel to it, I have to tell, particularly if it rains. So it captures that um, you know, feeling you might get when you walk uh, between skyscrapers uh, quite well. But there's also a lot of like really beautiful examples uh, with a lot of like you know positive atmosphere. Some of our participants also managed to hack Minecraft and have like a moving windmill. And uh, we also see a lot of code reuse. So uh, you actually see the same skyscrapers in several buildings because they were basically reused from an earlier entry and different people then edit different additional material um, for that. We also have internal furnishing, both like more ostentatious and Spartan and uh, some more avant-garde um, settlement generation. So um, what I'm basically, um, uh, want to talk about today is uh, well how does this competition work why are we actually uh, doing it and uh, what are the great opportunities that like offers to us you and uh, science in general so uh, with that let's um, dig right in so why did we organize this competition in the first place? So we wanted to create an AI competition that focuses on creativity and co-creativity with a particular focus on adaptive, holistic and open-ended um, generation. And I'm just going to briefly explain them separately so you see what they are and also why we want them. So the idea of adaptivity uh, we push by saying you can't just make like a Minecraft settlement on uh, an empty map. There's already some stuff there. And the challenge is to actually have your um, settlement or your generator react to this, right? So you don't just want to randomly create like different settlements for different maps, but you want there to be some kind of intention in the generator saying like, oh, this is maybe a nice seaside spot where we could build a harbor, or this is a nicely fortified place to, to build a fortress. And we're particularly narrowing in on the adaptivity because we think it's a roadmap towards co-creativity. So the first step, we want algorithms that can deal with things that are already on the map. But in another step, which we're actually starting this year, we want to put some existing buildings on the map that might have been built by a human and see how a generator extends upon this. So also a uh, great previous talk by Anastasia. Uh, so this idea of co-creativity, she's already explained a lot of it, so I can um, skip these parts. And if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. Um, and what we ultimately want, right, is some kind of embodied uh, Minecraft AI like a bot that can actually help you build along. But that will take a lot of work as it requires you to not just see what the human does, but also kind of understand the intentions behind it. And so there's a lot of like really cool, but also really hard AI stuff. But it's nice to get started here in um, the Minecraft world. And I think we can build upon the things that are already out there. The other big challenge we like to focus on and here. Again, you see why we chose settlement specifically is this idea of holistic PCG. So a lot of times when we're thinking about procedural content generation, it's a good idea to divide and conquer, to have things created separately and then maybe combine them. But for settlements, they do a lot of things at the same time. If you look at architecture, there's this idea that buildings functionality should reflect uh, should be reflected in their aesthetics. Uh, again, we have this idea of adaptivity, so you can't just build any building anywhere. It has to kind of fit in the existing city. It has to fit in the existing terrain. It has to provide affordances. It has to tell a story about who lives there, how it came about. It also has like some 
basic aesthetic guidelines. And these are actually all things we evaluate on. And the challenge is to have a procedural generator that can solve all of them in the same kind of tool at the same time. So this is the second big challenge here. And the third thing we tried to aim for was open endedness. And in the beginning, I often showed uh, this um, image here or this uh, video of a group of people. This is actually a human example of people building a Minecraft settlement together. And I usually include it to remind ourselves how good humans are as content generators. So particularly when working in the field of procedural content generation, we kind of get used to what a computer can do. And then it's amazing if we see a computer which is better than its computer peers. But if we're aiming for like human level procedural content generation, there's a level of like adaptivity, there's a level of creativity, there's a level of, you know, making all of this fit together that is actually really, really hard to kind of copy. And so we're aiming for an AI that ultimately will maybe pass the test of not being differentiable anymore from a human. And on the other hand, again, Minecraft is a beautiful field for this because it's easy to get started. I mean, building a little generator that puts a house down or a road, you can do that um, in 10, 15 minutes, but it's really hard to master to kind of uh, drag up that old cliche. So, and the other thing is, it's there's a lot of ways on how to be good um, in this particular space, a lot of ways to make good settlements. So there's not one single ideal function. And again, we also deliberately decided against having a computer evaluatable fitness function as it just often kind of deteriorates to this optimization towards a specific um, fitness function, which then often really, really kind of narrows down the solutions. And the same thing is we also specifically didn't want a competition specifically designed for one algorithm alone. So what did we learn um, while we were doing this? So first of all, uh, this is a slide where I should have a shout out to our great community. So at this point we have about, um, we have several hundred, maybe two, three hundred people on our Discord, uh, a lot of them actively participating and um, they uh, put a lot of work and a lot of really interesting ideas into this. And our participants who actually end up submitting range anywhere from like school kids to university groups to kind of couples sitting on the couch to scientists not affiliated with us who try to do real research there. And um, there's a lot of different solutions they're coming up with and some of them which we wouldn't have thought of. And we also learned that frameworks is hard. So again, here our community has massively stepped up. So first of all, Minecraft again has a lot of tools already out there. We've worked a lot with MC Edit at the beginning, but actually now uh, somebody in our community has developed like an HTTP based interface tool, which allows you to not just connect to Minecraft as a forge based mod, if that means anything to you in any kind of language with your client, but also allows you to actually build stuff in real time while you're kind of looking at what the AI is doing, which was one of the wishes our competitors had for quite some time and would allow like more interactivity as you're actually you yourself in that uh, Minecraft world. So what are um, the great opportunities here? So there's two things I want to highlight. Um, one is the leveled playing field for AI, and the other one is this being a new approach to um, citizen science. So, as I said before, we were very keen on not designing this as a competition for a specific kind of solution. And uh, we, and as a result, what we've noticed is that it's actually quite suitable to compare different kind of and very, very different kind of AI or algorithm approaches and see then how they measure up with each other at the end. So a lot of the stuff you've seen is a very straightforward what you would expect, like there's some search based um, placement of buildings. There's some uh, very straightforward um, grammar and parameter based change of buildings. Uh, there's some rule based adaptation of the materials used, but particularly in the fourth year now, we're seeing a lot of cool and diverse um, tech solutions. So I've copied some stuff from our Discord here. So 
some of our participants ended up uh, experimenting with generally advers uh, general adversarial networks where they trained on existing Minecraft city blocks. And here again, you have this advantage that there's a lot of examples for Minecraft cities out there and uh, created again that then create settlements. And does this really measure up to what a human with a rule based well designed system can do? Not at the moment, but if you expand upon this, I mean, it could grow beyond that and you can actually see how one compares to the other. And the other thing here is a lot of other competitions where AIs fight against each other um, then provide something that isn't that easy to interact with as a human. But these settlements, you can actually play with them. We run like an exhibition server where you can sample a lot of the generated things. You can even have humans compete against AIs and see how they kind of stack up. We also have more semantic based approaches and uh, here we're actually quite happy that um, uh, Levy, uh, who's a researcher I think in the Netherlands, uh, ended up uh, publishing on the work he's done uh, very closely associated and with this generator and I applaud him for the courage of you know not just having a solution that works well in his like um, specifically selected lab setting but then going out there adapting this to this open competition and see how his scientific approach stacks up against uh, some of the other um, competitors. And uh, we also have uh, Niels, who's uh, been um, using the very fashionable method of wave function collapse, which is about kind of collapsing probability spaces uh, in an attempt to build some kind of cyberpunk underground city. So this is like early stages right now, but I think it kind of showcases the uh, breadth of uh, the possible um, approaches you could use here. And the other big point I wanted to highlight is um, uh, how this is an approach or a new approach to citizen science. So um, when we talk about citizen science, we often think about non-scientists kind of doing the legwork, like identifying star systems, folding proteins, solving puzzles. Um, but here for this approach, I think it's possible and we see that happen that um, non-academics and non-scientists can get interested in this and actually provide ideas which kind of meaningful contribute to how we could tackle some of these big creativity or computational creativity question. And of course, a lot of the approaches are chosen, are um, naive and well established, but there's definitely some kind of technological insights and uh, cool ideas that's come out of this that got our like you know, advisory board and a lot of the uh, judges who were also academics in their own rights talking and uh, got very excited. And furthermore, um, there's also not just um, this kind of new insight into the technology side, but also uh, we've learned a lot about how people engage with procedural content generation, how they think about it, how they also experience using the end product, um, which we found very valuable. And we think that having this wider perspective there of like a wider pool of participants who have genuine interest in this, uh, you know, provides like a lot of different viewpoints on this which are uh, very meaningful for AI development. So um, yes, uh, if you're interested, uh, this is a community you can join and uh, people on there like develop not just frameworks, um, they share articles, papers, videos, um, and uh, they discuss and develop new PCG approaches. So um, you could do that too. So what's our greatest challenge right now? So I talked a little bit about earlier with the framework being hard and um, this in many ways was uh, a technical challenge because uh, we we're also kind of organizing this nearly as a hobby as scientists, right? Um, and so um, getting all our ducks in a row there and, uh, you know, providing a usable, well-tested, stable framework and great tutorials is something that is very hard to pull off on a limited time budget. but what we also uh, are often struggling with is uh, getting the word out. So we have a growing community and we end up with more and more submissions every year. But if you're interested in this, we would really appreciate it if um, you know you tell others about it and uh, see if um, they want to contribute. And if you're interested in working together with us or participating or um, have a 
cool research idea or any kind of idea related to this, uh, you should definitely um, reach out to us, um, contact us and um, uh, give us a shout out. And uh, we're happy to hear from you. So once again, in summary, uh, we've just kicked up, um, uh, kicked off the fourth round uh, for the uh, AI settlement generation competition. And if you find this is a great idea or maybe you have students who you think this would be a great idea for them. Um, get involved and uh, we like to hear from you and uh, uh, that's my talk. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Christoph. That was super interesting to see how the different solutions have changed over the years of this running and I hope you get, got a lot of people interested. Um, as before, if you have more questions on this, then uh, please do go ahead and um, put your questions in the moder moderated QA, and then we can handle them in the shared Q&A session after York's talk, which um, is coming up now. Uh, York Norman is the lead for Microsoft Flight Simulator, and he will be talking to us about how he generates the three mod 3D model of the Earth that you can fly over, because as I've learned, it's not just a static model. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today some of the thinking, the R&D and the AI work that went into creating the new Microsoft Flight Simulator. I don't know how much you know about the franchise, um, but we launched a new version uh, last August. It's the first one in 14 years. And for this new version, the team um, used a combination of Bing Maps and Azure and real-time data sources to create a digital twin of Earth. And today's presentation focuses on two aspects. The first one is the usage of machine learning uh, in, in, in the construction of the digital twin. And the second part is about the potential usage of a digital twin uh, to advance real-time, uh, real-world AI image recognition. So a quick look at the franchise. Um, this is one of the longest running uh, series in all of computer entertainment, going all the way back to 1982. <laughs> in the history of Microsoft, it predates Windows and Office, and it's our longest running active franchise. Uh, the quality has always been great, and the series is famous for um, pushing what was technically possible um, on a PC at the time of each release. Um, so when we started discussing uh, creating a new version into the franchise, we felt it was critically important to have meaningful innovations. And just to put you in the mood and where we come from, here's a quick trailer we put together. They became a, a pretty long way in the last 38 years. Um, as the famous series is now four decades old, it has uh, gathered a unique and incredibly loyal community. We call them flight simmers. And for them, this is their hobby. Highly dedicated, super knowledgeable. Many, many of them are pilots. And uh, they're an incredible resource for us. And before we even wrote one line of code, uh, we engaged with the community. We listened uh, in the forums and blogs, asked them what was working, was not working. And some things were very expected. Um, they, most of them said they would like a modern looking game. Comparisons to our own Forza came up quite a bit that takes advantage of modern uh, rendering and hardware techniques and multi-threading. 
But the number one thing uh, that was a little bit more specific and surprised us a little bit was the desire to have uh, visual flight rules on a global scale. Basically, VFR means that the pilot is navigating by using the visuals of the terrain outside, which requires that we have an accurate depiction uh, of the world below. On the right, you see a typical flight plan, but on the left, you see uh, an airstrip, and um, one of them is a real world um, photograph. The other one is in the simulation. And you can see that um, it's virtually indistinguishable. And um, this type of detail has really only been possible in uh, small sections of the world, specifically hand created um, and, and, and really even the large $10 million level D simulator that the, uh, the airline industry is using. Um, they didn't have that on a global scale. So how, what changed? How is, it, how is VFR on a global scale in a product like ours possible? Uh, and the key enabler is that the world is being scanned. Um, there are cameras everywhere, you know that. I mean, they're in our phones, in our cars, our front doors, but more importantly, over 2000 satellites circle the earth and send data across the virtual spectrum and thousands of planes flying overhead, sending not aer only aerial imagery, but also weather information, turbulence data, et cetera, et cetera, in real time. We, for example, have access to the transponder signals of all planes that are currently on earth. The amount of data is really staggering. And what makes, the way I always said is that what makes our planet tick, that data is available often in real time to a product like ours now. Uh, so this allows us to simulate the world more realistically and more accurately than ever before. And luckily at Microsoft, we're fortunate enough to have an awesome tech stack that really helps us utilize and operate on all this data. So uh, Bing Maps, for example, stores over two petabyte of aerial uh, satellite imagery and allows us to get an amazing 2D representation of the planet. Azure helps us with storage and delivery. For example, we have the two petabytes, but we need to get them to the end consumer. Azure makes that possible at low latency. Then there's also Azure Compute, which we use a lot. Um, um, we'll talk about this later to allow us to um, basically spin up tons of virtual machines that we need to process our data into one machine learning algorithms basically constantly. And then we have Azure a Machine Learning Center, which is allowing us to elegantly manage all that processing. And then finally, cognitive services help us with text to speech and speech synthesis, which is really important for uh, specifically the air traffic controller. But let's look a little bit about how we build the digital twin. So the Bing Maps offers 400 cities like this one here in New York. Uh, in full 3D, it's called photogrammetry. The resolution is uh, really good, down to 7.5 centimeters, and it looks really amazing in the sim. The problem we have is that 99.8% of the planet has never been available in 3D. So in order to get to the consumer need, global VFR, we had to come up, we had to do some key R&D efforts to actually enable a procedural augmentation of the world. And here's, uh, here's a city um, that's fully procedural, Rio de Janeiro. Um, we partnered with some of the best geospatial computer vision researchers in the world, uh, Black Shark AI from Graz, Austria. And the challenge was how to get from a 2D image to a 3D world. Here you see Graz in, 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 in Bing, it's 2D, and we'll add all the 3D elements in real time via machine learning. Our AI extracts information from aerial imagery and constructs a photorealistic digital twin. You can see that here, for example, in, in Salt Lake. And the next example here in Paris, we built the Eiffel Tower, Lac de Triomphe, and the Louvre, and everything else you see here is procedural. So how do we do that? For example, we start with houses. A deep learning neural network classifies buildings, vegetation and roads, and then we reconstruct detected buildings in high detail 3D. Here's um, an example of Vancouver. Um, it's completely flat in Bing. And then we basically classify uh, and we, we gain this data in 3D in real time. And the results are excellent to make the player feel like they're really flying over the real world. So the houses, for example, we've started with building footprints, type, height, rooftops, all being segmented by neural network. And then additional attributes like facades are being added automatically based on geographical regions to ensure they look authentic wherever they are placed. Here's Earth, and that's really a demonstration of the power of AI combined with the outstanding um, tech we have in the Azure cloud. Using hundreds of VMs in parallel, 
we're able to process the entire planet in less than 72 hours. During that time, the pipeline ingests several petabytes of data and outputs 1.5 billion buildings and 2 trillion trees. All the cities you hear are procedurally, fully procedurally generated. And what's really exciting for us is this is just the beginning because the data is getting better and better all the time. I call the static world, but what about the atmosphere? It is the it is the natural habitat where planes live, and um, we had to take another major R and D effort and breakthroughs in order to take that to the next level. Um, we partnered with a company in Switzerland called Media Blue, one of the top weather uh, tracking and forecasting companies, and they collect a vast array of data, including wind, temperature, humidity, and have uh, awesome AI to build the incredibly accurate weather forecasting model. They divide the atmosphere above the Earth in about a, in 250 million boxes in 60 layers. And the, the simulation is so accurate that we can get humidity, things like rainbows in the actually correct uh, right positions where that would, uh, the would happen. Same with um, cloud formation and dissolution. In addition to weather, we also simulate the sun position at different times of the year, full day and night cycle. And here you see the atmospheric simulation at work with time lapse. And here, this one over the sunset in Seattle. This dynamic aspect sets us apart from all the other planet wide reconstructions like Bing, Bing Maps or Google Earth. Um, so, as far as the consumer said, super good uh, reaction, but we also had tons of interest from industry, and I wanted to show you that a little bit. So, given recent troubles, the airline industry is very focused on safety, reliability of the aircraft, and want to strengthen. Two elements, pilots and pilot training and autopilots, specifically heavier emphasis on machine learning. So many manufacturers are just at the beginning of the digital transformation and they're looking for a platform to make this happen and they're asking us to help them. So why us? Why a game? Well, uh, there's lots of static 3 3D representations. We all know Google Earth and we at Microsoft have our own Bing Maps. And there are a few others. So the issue with all these representations of the planet is that they are what I call static digital twins. Most of these have buildings in some areas, sometimes sophisticated, yet pretty expensive photogrammetry, but nobody has a full 3D representation uh, of Earth, which is what our procedural generation helps us with. But even then, it's still just a 3D static environment. And frankly, for machine learning, static is not really all that useful. So let's look at level D simulators, which is the top end of the aviation industry. Um, full motion environments fed by the actual plane telemetry, precise and authentic flight models and flight decks with extensive air systems, et cetera, et cetera. So quite sophisticated on the airplane side, but quite primitive on the environment and world representation side. Uh, the simulators often have only a few hand-built airports and training environments, and their visual representation is quite poor, like really like 10 years ago kind of things, and therefore neither useful or, or not used for AI or machine learning due to its lack of markup and inaccurate and primitive representation of the world. So, and that's actually one of the key problems. Um, this, this next comes up here in the next section. What you need is a marked up 3D world. Uh, which is what leads us what we have in flight sim. What you really need in order to effectively train an AI um, is that is intended to operate specifically in the real world via machine learning is a lot of data. And unlike most other 3D worlds, ours is already fully marked up uh, because we frankly needed that for our own AI. Here you can see Toronto, the buildings are red, streets are blue, trees are green. And the airport we're approaching here straight up is yellow. All of our markup is done procedurally, except the airports, and we have that markup worldwide. Uh, the airports are interesting in that um, there are 37,000 of them, and we mark those up by hand simply because we needed them for flight simulation. And we have now a complete database of, of all 37,000, which uh, accurate runways, taxiways, parking spots, et cetera, et cetera. In the aviation industry right now, world markup is usually done by a human. It's very time consuming. It's error prone and expensive. And um, so, and, and oftentimes only a fraction is marked up. So what we really want is a 4D dynamic simulation um, because that's the real world. Collecting dynamic 4D data is actually really difficult. Right now it's taken from airplanes that take a few photos and that's fed into the machine learning models and that just doesn't scale. So what we need is data for all circumstances. We need reference data for different times of day, different times of year, 
and as the position of the sun greatly matters to the overall um, visibility. But it's not just time of day and time of year. It's uh, there's also a um, visual dynamic atmospheric simulation that goes beyond that. Um, let's just see this weather come by. So we need we need all kinds of different types of atmospheric conditions that are imaginable. Like we know that the what the particle density is, what type of particle it is. Is it raining, snowing? Is it hailing? Is the visibility impaired due to wildfires, sandstorms, what have you? Feeding information like this into the machine learning system is critical, and it is essential that all the sensors, as that that is what the sensors of the airplane or the airplane autopilot will see. And all we, and we need all that worldwide in order to truly make it scalable for the aviation industry, because they obviously fly everywhere on Earth. And then there's another aspect, not visual, it's the invisible elements of the dynamic um, simulation. It's um, as you saw earlier, we have, a, we have a full worldwide weather simulation in real time, but for the purposes of ML and training an autopilot, we can simulate any, and any temperature, any air pressure, and any wind condition that might be affecting the plane. Here you see our particle system at work. Uh, it's fully controllable, and you can, as you can see, it will calculate the movement of the particles over our detailed world. The movement is physically accurate, um, and that means the particles slow down and cool off as they move up the mountainside. And equally, they speed up and heat up as they move down on the other side, and that creates realistic turbulences in the process. And that is all obviously critical to airplanes because turbulences is one of the one of the more major causes for accidents. So you can see it fall again. And it's great for gliders down there. <laughs> all the turbulences here you can see a thunderstorm. The particles move up the edge at the front and due to the pressure it quickly falls inside the thunderstorm, which makes flying through these storms so dangerous. So our ability to simulate any uh, weather anywhere on Earth in close relationship with accurate visuals is something truly new. So in summary, with the digital twin we developed, frankly, for the flight simmers, because they wanted that for flight sim, we can now solve industry problems by providing a solution to capture, tag, mark up photorealistic 4D data for the entire globe at will and with extreme efficiency and turnaround time. So thank you for your time. Uh, we feel we have achieved a lot <laughs> in our goal to innovate and push the flight simulation um, experiment forward. I was also asked, uh, what are the biggest challenges? The, one of the biggest challenges is that our, our videos and the, the flight sim itself look so good from certain perspectives <laughs> that industry now thinks we can solve all problems. So we've been asked to do automated uh, <clears throat> um, autonomous driving cars on the streets or uh, logistics issues on oceans. And our flight sim is, has the, most of the data is captured from an airplane perspective and it's really mostly used usable from there. So the challenge is to sort of set expectations with industry right now because there's a lot. And that's it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jörg. That was super impressive. And I guess I know where to go now if it's again super misty and gray in Copenhagen. <laughs> um, with that, we uh, still are collecting questions. Uh, from everyone in the moderated Q&A session. So please feel free to add questions for York's talk or any other talk, just indicate whose talk you're um, asking about. And um, I just heard we have um, a lot of questions and 17 minutes left. So um, I'm just going to start picking some that were upvoted a lot. And starting with Anastasia, there. Uh, were a few questions or uh, upvoted questions about the difference between human perception in artistic, artistically generated environments and the very numerical uh, measures that you're using to express similarity or how how good it fits. Um, specifically, someone mentioned the oatmeal problem in procedural generation, um, where Generated results are technically unique, but perceived as the same by players. Um, so what are you doing about these uh, challenges around human perception and measuring something numerically? Right. Uh, so 
With oatmeal problem, I think it's also important to ask, first of all, what is the goal of the generator at question? Um, but so if the generator's goal is to be at the background, for example, then I think it's very different how we evaluate it versus if it's something that is there to give meaning to what the player is doing. But I think like because this question has been, has been surfaced so many times, I think it just highlights the thirst for meaning in games from players. And uh, kind of on top of my head, uh, I'm thinking of like how in roguelikes, for example, when you are facing sort of permutated variations, but dependent on what kind of items you have that kind of give meaning to the content that you're perceiving. So you can have the same content, but because of the different context, it would feel different. But it's also very hard to evaluate. Like I was thinking that, okay, we can, um, like how do we incorporate evaluating that the procedural generation that we have is meaningful every time, not just different every time, but that depends solely on the project and also the target user experience. Right. Um, interesting, uh, que a similar question came up uh, for Christoph as well, because you went the opposite route and didn't um, do numerical evaluation. Instead, you have uh, a few judges um, trying to evaluate Humans, yeah. it. <laughs> Humans, that's the word. Um, are there, um, what, so what do you think about this problem between perception and um, evaluation and turning this on its head? Are there solutions that are very surprising that just fit some of your uh, judging criteria um, that you didn't expect or didn't really want to see? So I think a lot of our judges are uh, coincidentally aware of the thousand uh, bowls of oatmeal problem and specifically reward those things that, that break out of it, right? So we have three maps for each generator. And if you open all three of them and every time you see like the same kind of sea of houses, then they go, okay, this is nice, but this could be better, right? And if you, so we've seen a big trend to have really cool big features and have like kind of, you know, different things happening. And if these different things are actually meaningful, right? Which again, I mean, as I think also Anastasia talked about it, right? A lot of it is about that kind of grounding stuff in kind of the underlying game. You don't just want to make content, but somehow should reflect like maybe play differences in the map. And they really like that. And I think that's also a way of kind of breaking out of this, right? Because for us, we are not really interested in having PCG that can provide a lot of variety. I mean, our generators, right, could be deterministic. Right? We want to feed them a map, and if they provide the same output every time, that's fine. We just want it to be different based on what we input. Right, So it's not so much about having this kind of stirring variation, but having a good answer to different questions. Very cool, yeah. Speaking of, <laughs> you got me my segue about aesthetic environments, um, since the flight simulator one, isn't and I've heard people are still collecting their jaws from the floor. But in the meantime, uh, there was questions about specifically about the weather simulation model and whether that can be used in other contexts, specifically in fictitious environments, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no reason not to. Um, fundamentally, this is a vector field uh, and a physical simulation. So this is, I think we've done some, we've made some real breakthroughs to make this happen on a, uh, just a multi-threaded computer. Um, so that you didn't used to be in games, but I, you know, I've been building game worlds 25 years now. And I, what I'm excited about is that we can do this type of thing anywhere. You know, I remember placing down individual trees and stuff, and I think that those those times really we can, we can sort of move beyond that. And and once the world is there, you can operate on the world better, and you can think about things like, what do I want the weather to be in this world? What is the logic? What's the predominant wind direction? What are the seasons like? You know, and you basically feed that into the algorithmic model, and you can get a completely believable, repeatable weather pattern for your for your digital world. So I think what it's going to be amazing to, to bring this to other fictitious places. Yeah, I definitely agree that be a lot of realism. Um, and in your talk, you talked uh, a lot about scaling this because it's a whole um, world simulation. Um, and there were also questions for Anastasia around scaling this. I'm just going to pose it to all three of you because I think um, the Minecraft settlement generation also has a thing about variety and how much to learn from it. So uh, to each of you, how um, 
are you handling scale? What is like the minimum scale your methods would work? And what are the challenges there? Oh, I, I think, think Anastasia is muted. muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, um, as I was saying, um, first so for us, we were explicitly operating on small environments because we wanted the player to feel like they're having a dialogue with the Kitai and having that feeling that they created something together. Um, but the method itself that is, that is uh, separate from the uh, Kitai project, uh, like you can use one example and basically populate as big as you want the map, but you will definitely start seeing the repetition based on how small or large your example is because we're just inferring statistical rules. And uh, just to follow up on this, sorry. Um, what about like the number of different objects you uh, can create? Because you, you're building the statistical model, so you need enough examples to have like confident predictions about where to place them, right? Uh, the cool part of our method is that we can just have one example. And as long as we have at least a couple of objects, that will be the all rules you will have. And the more objects you'll have, the more rules we have. Actually, finally, uh, I think this method falls more in its face the more objects you have, because the more rules you have, and then the uh, generator has to figure out, oh, did you mean that this rock needs to be close to the tree, or was it done by accident? And here comes all this ambiguity of what did the user actually intended versus what was accidental. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to the world sim. So we are like I tried to show that in the video. The the, the buildings are put together VR basically simple forms, right? The, the 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 little windows, the doorways and whatnot. And um so as far as memory, it's very, very light. And um we are currently in the process of doing what we call world updates. So we take a particular region of Earth. Last week I think it was uh United Kingdom and Ireland. And for that we create specific geometry that is appropriate for that region. For example, churches in England look like churches in England. The English countryside houses and Victorian houses look exactly like they should. And um, but a lot of the the actual data load sits in the cloud. So we're actually streaming that nowadays. Like we, we don't even put it locally on a machine anymore. So you can imagine that you can get into a, like a much, much greater level of detail across the board as long as you stream it in, right? And for me, that was kind of the breakthrough really on this product because, you know, we have petabytes of data. There's no there's no storage device that we can afford <laughs> that has petabytes of data. So we, but so you come up with the cloud as a solution, a depository and a streamer, and then I think you can go very, very far. Yeah, I mean, for us uh, also scaling is an interesting issue, but we kind of put the kind of difficulty off to the participants because first of all, I mean, it is a real problem in and human creativity too, right? Imagine you're writing a book and there's like millions of books out there and you're not like studying all of them to write like the perfect new book. You just ignore most of it. And I think that's the solution here, right? So this turnaround, we actually will look at much larger Minecraft maps and part of the challenge will be to figure out what part you build in and what part you look at. And uh, I think we've seen a solution in previous years where people were actually leaning into agent-based simulations, right? So this actual embodied idea works there. So they just send 10 agents out, they run around, they look at stuff and what they find is what they find. And they might not be able to look at the whole world, but that's fine because in reality, this might also happen, right? They look at a little bit and that keeps kind of the effort constant and then they build stuff wherever they find them. But, you know, figuring out how to ignore stuff, particularly in a computer setting, is uh, difficult. Right. I guess the solution is to pick your battles. <laughs> and um, there is another question kind of flipping the talks on uh, their heads about what kind of not to do, specifically for Anastasia in this case, um, what type of content would you not apply these methods to? It's an interesting question. Um, so I'd say for anything structured, so anything like a building where you need to close precise snapping because of the way we mutate placements, we just like pick a random location in the world. Is it better? No, try again. So if you're like, for example, want to build a nice structured cathedral, you will get a mess. But for things that are more natural looking, that would be um, kind of it can cope with the fact that you have uh, 
very kind of relative positions. So in a way, in regards, it's almost similar to wave function collapse, except not being on the grid and dealing with things that are not on the grid, but it fails completely if it thinks that you want to be more grid based. And uh, to both of us, feel free if you want to comment on these, because I know York talked about how it's not directly applicable to traffic simulations, for example. But someone also asked about uh, applications maybe in the climate, um, about climate change and sustainability. Yeah, so climate change is actually a big topic in our team because we, you know, as I said, we get a lot of data from satellites. NASA, for example, has a whole array just looking at the uh, ice expansion all the time, uh, comes to, comes in in real time. So we just recently put that in, and I think what we can, we what on a planetary basis, I think we can operate really well. On the microclimate side, not so much, because we, at that point we're more in a prediction model sense, and it's no longer accurate. But I think uh, like flooding, those types of things, I think there's a there are micro operations. I think we can help, and that's where industries get quite interested. Um, you know, I could I could name all kinds of examples where people think we can be helpful in finding ruins in the in the in the under, somewhere under the forest in you know in Mexico or something like that. Simply because lidar shows you those types of things. So I think this digital twin, the you can operate on a lot of different levels to to really learn something. Um, so yeah, I think the answer is yes. Can I actually ask a question for Jörg there? <laughs> Uh, because I was wondering if you have any like insight from a game design perspective, why you do this. I mean, particularly if you're looking at turbulence, right? I mean, you could also just have a random number generator that rattles the plane once in a while, right? And there seems to be a real hunger with your players to have this like incredibly grounded simulation, right? You know, the, I, the, I give you the emotional answer. That life <laughs> is an adventure. Every time you jump into an airplane, it's an adventure. You have no idea what's coming. And the unpredictability of it all is what makes a difference. We we have a tool. We can make whatever weather we want. We can have tornadoes and whatever we really want. But the the the, the thing that actually happens in real world, actually like actually, is is mm. is it's beautiful and it's surprising. And it, it's what keeps it interesting. So it's it is the generation of of interest because the world is nope. interesting. I mean, I, I agree, but I was thinking that, you know, you're, imagine you're, you could like just have the plane crash randomly with a very small chance or have turbulence with a very small chance, but your players would feel like betrayed, right? Well, if you go and say, look, we've went this whole way and simulated all these particles, simulated all these models, and they go like, this is amazing, right? So there is this unpredictability. Ability, but it feels like you know people can become kind of discoverers as well, right? You can kind I, of figure out how these things work while you're playing it. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, we, we went to a trade show last year where hardcore Call of Duty players for the first time tried a flight simulation. And, you know, they, they think of themselves as awesome game players. They were sweating because of a landing challenge, because it felt real. And the, the, the fact that they had transposed themselves like everything here is real, I need to pay attention, is what, what it, it creates a difference. It goes back to what somebody else said about the, can we do weather in, 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 in fictional worlds? I think we absolutely should because the logic of it will it will take on a life of its own, and that's why people immerse themselves. I think in three D in three D fictional worlds because they want to they want to have a discovery. They want to have an adventure. Thank you. Um, we have about two minutes left, so maybe we can have a last question to everyone. Speaking of the very complex systems, is there a really cool way to figure out? how to evaluate the performance of the algorithm and how to systematically improve it without getting lost and not being able to measure or visualize anything. And that goes to everyone. Well, maybe I'll start because this is actually something I personally uh, really would like to work on scientifically. And I wonder, so I think they're like human minds, right? Have this capability of like do stuff by themselves, like make art, write stuff, and then kind of set their own goals and evaluate their own stuff, right? Without having to show this to people. And I'm keen on figuring out if we can actually imitate it because I think a lot of that stuff is uh, missing right now with um, AI research where we have these extrinsic goals. So I think there is such a thing in reality and I think in uh, computational creativity, this is still to a large degree like a very open question in my mind. I mean, I sure would, know, would like to know the answer. 
But uh, if there are no more remarks from the speakers, um, we'll, we're going to end this session here right on time. Right. Um, so that means uh, we're wrapping up here. There are other sessions you can go to if you, uh, after a short break, if you want to stay on the computational creativity track, you can just stay here or otherwise you should head to the parallel session for more interesting talks. Thank you guys for your questions and thanks to the speakers. And see you yep. later. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye.